Lesson 15. Strange Astral Phenomena by William Walker Atkinson. There are several phases of astral phenomena other than those mentioned in the preceding chapters, which it will be better for the student to become acquainted with in order to round out his general knowledge of the subject. Although the manifestations are comparatively rare and not so generally recognized in works on this subject, one of the first of these several phases of astral phenomena is that which may be called thought form projection. This manifestation comes into place on the psychic scale, just between ordinary clairvoyance on the one hand and astral body projection on the other. It has some of the characteristics of each and is often mistaken for one or the other of these phases. To understand this phenomena, the student should know something regarding the fact that thought frequently takes on astral form and that these manifestations are known as thought forms. I have spoken of these in some of the preceding lessons. The ordinary thought form is quite simple as a rule and does not bear any particular resemblance to the sender thereof. But in some cases a person may, consciously or unconsciously, strongly and clearly think of himself as present at some other place, and thus actually create a thought form of himself at that place, which may be discerned by those having clairvoyant vision. Moreover, this thought form of himself is connected psychically with himself and affords a channel of psychic information for him. As a rule, these thought forms are only projected by those who have trained their minds and will along occult lines. But occasionally, under the stress of strong emotion or desire, an ordinary person may focus his psychic power to such an extent that the phenomena is manifested. Here I will quote from an English investigator of astral phenomena, who has had much experience on that plane. He says, all students are aware that thought takes form at any rate upon its own plane, and in the majority of cases upon the astral plane also. But it may not be so generally known that if a man thinks strongly of himself as present at any given place, the form assumed by that particular thought will be a likeness of the thinker himself, which will appear at the place in question. Essentially this form must be composed of the matter of the mental plane, but in very many cases it would draw around itself matter of the astral plane also and so would approach much nearer to visibility. There are, in fact, many instances in which it has been seen by the person thought of most probably by means of the unconscious influence emanating from the original thinker. None of the consciousness of the thinker would, however, be included within this thought form. When once sent out from him, it would normally be a quite separate entity not indeed absolutely unconnected with its maker, but practically so as far as the possibility of receiving any impression through it is concerned. This type of clairvoyance consists, then, in the power to retain so much connection with and so much hold over a newly created thought form as will render it possible to receive impressions by means of it. Such impressions as were made upon the form would in this case be transmitted to the thinker not along an astral telegraph line, but by a sympathetic vibration. In a perfect case of this kind of clairvoyance, it is almost as though the seer projected a part of his consciousness into the thought form and used it as a kind of outpost from which observation was possible. He sees almost as well as he would if he himself stood in the place of his thought form. The figures at which he is looking will appear to him as of life size and close to hand, instead of tiny and at a distance as in the case of some other forms of clairvoyance and he will find it possible to shift his point of view if he wishes to do so. Clairaudience is perhaps less frequently associated with this type of clairvoyance than with the others, but its place is to some extent taken by a kind of mental perception of the thoughts and intentions of those who are seen. Since the man's consciousness is still in the physical body, he will be able, even when exercising this faculty, to hear and to speak, in so far as he can do this without any distraction of his attention. The moment that the intentness of his thought fails, the whole vision is gone, and he will have to construct a fresh thought form before he can resume it. Instances in which this kind of sight is possessed with any degree of perfection by untrained people are naturally rarer than in the other types of clairvoyance, because the capacity for mental control required and the generally finer nature of the forces employed. I may mention that this particular method is frequently employed by advanced occultists of all countries being preferred for various reasons. Some of the reasons of this preference as follows. A. The ability to shift the vision, and to turn around almost as well as in the case of actual astral body projection, this gives quite an advantage to this method over the method of ordinary clairvoyance. B. It does away with certain disadvantages of going out into the astral in the astral body, 
which only trained occultists realize it gives almost the same results as astral body clairvoyance, without a number of disadvantages and inconveniences. In India, especially, this form of clairvoyance is comparatively frequent. This by reason of the fact that the Hindus, as a race, are far more psychic than are those of the Western lands, all else considered. And besides, there are a much greater number of highly developed occultists there than in the West. Moreover, there is a certain psychic atmosphere surrounding India, by reason of its thousands of years of deep interest in things psychic and spiritual, all of which renders the production of psychic phenomena far easier than in other lands. In India, moreover, we find many instances of another form of psychic, or astral phenomena. I allude to the production of thought-form pictures which are plainly visible to one or more persons. This phase of psychic phenomena is the real basis for many of the wonder tales which Western travelers bring back with them from India. The wonderful cases of magical appearance of living creatures and plants and other objects out of the clear air are the result of this psychic phenomena. That is to say, the creatures and objects are not really produced they are but astral appearances resulting from the projection of powerful thought forms from the mind of the magician or other wonder worker of whom India has a plentiful supply. Even the ignorant fakirs, I use the word in its true sense, not in the sense given it by American slang, even these itinerant showmen of psychic phenomena, are able to produce phenomena of this kind which seems miraculous to those witnessing them. As for the trained occultists of India, I may say that their feats, when they deign to produce them, seem to overturn every theory and principle of materialistic philosophy and science. But in nearly every case the explanation is the same the projection of a strong and clear thought form on a large scale. Although I have purposely omitted reference to Hindu psychic phenomena in this book, for the reason given in my introduction, I find it necessary to quote cases in India in this connection, for the simple reason that there are but few counterparts in the Western world. There are no itinerant wonder workers of this kind in Western lands. And the trained occultists of the West, of course, would not consent to perform feats of this kind for the amusement of persons seeking merely sensations. The trained wills of the West are given rather to materializing objectively on the physical plane, creating great railroads, buildings, bridges, etc., from the mental pictures, rather than devoting the same time, energy, and will to the production of astral though forms and pictures. There is a great difference in temperament as well as a difference in the general psychic atmosphere between East and West, which serves to explain matters of this kind. An American writer truly says, the first principle underlying the whole business of Hindu wonderworking is that of a strong will, and the first necessary condition of producing a magical effect is an increase in the power of thought. The Hindus, owing to that intense love for solitary meditation, which has been one of the most pronounced characteristics from time immemorial, have acquired mental faculties of which we of the Western and younger civilization are totally ignorant. The Hindu has attained a past master's degree in speculative philosophy. He has for years retired from meditation to the silent places in his land, lived a hermit, subdued the body and developed the mind, thus winning control over other minds. In India, I have seen scenes of far distant places appearing as a mirage in clear air, even the colors being present to the scenes. This, though somewhat uncommon, was simply a remarkable instance of thought-form projection from the mind of a man highly developed along occult lines. You must remember that in order to produce a picture in the astral of this kind, the occultist must not only have the power of will and mind to cause such a picture to materialize, but he must also have a remarkable memory for detail in the picture for nothing appears in the picture unless it has already been pictured in the mind of the mind of the man himself. Such a memory and perception of detail is very rare in the Western world it is possessed by only exceptional artists. However, anyone may cultivate this perception and memory if he will give the time and care to it that the Hindu magicians do. You have heard of the Hindu mango trick, in which the magician takes a mango seed, plants it in the ground, waves his hands over it, and then causes first a tiny shoot to appear from the surface of the ground this followed by a tiny trunk and leaves which grow and grow until at last appears a full-sized mango tree which first shows blossoms and then ripe fruit. In short, in a few moments, the magician has produced that which nature require years to do that is he apparently does this. What he really does is to produce a wonderful thought form in the astral 
from seed stage to tree and fruit stage, the astral picture reproducing perfectly the picture in his own mind. It is as if he were creating a moving picture film roll in his mind, and then projecting this upon the screen of the air. There is no mango tree there, and never was, outside of the mind of the magician and the minds of his audience. In the same way, the magician will seem to throw the end of a rope up into the air. It travels far up until the end is lost sight of. Then he sends a boy climbing up after it, until he too disappears from sight. Then he causes the whole thing to disappear, and lo, the boy is seen standing among the audience. The boy is real, of course, but he never left the spot the rest was all an appearance caused by the mind and will of the magician, pictured in the astral as a thought form. In the same way, the magician will seem to cut the boy into bits, and then cause the severed parts to spring together and reassemble themselves. These feats may be varied indefinitely, but the principle is ever the same thought form projection. Western visitors have sought to obtain photographs of these feats of the Hindu magicians, but their plates and films invariably show nothing whatever except the old fakir sitting quietly in the center, with a peculiar expression in his eyes. This is as might be expected, for the picture exists only in the astral, and is perceived only by the awakened astral senses of those present which have been stimulated into activity by the power of the magician by sympathetic vibration, to be exact. Moreover, in certain instances it has been found that the vision is confined to a limited area. Persons outside of the limit ring see nothing, and those moving nearer to the magician lose sight of what they had previously seen. There are scientific reasons for this last fact, which need not be gone into at this place. The main point I am seeking to bring out is that these wonderful scenes are simply and wholly thought form pictures in the astral, perceived by the awakened astral vision of those present. This to be sure is wonderful enough, but still no miracle has been worked. I may mention here that these magicians begin their training from early youth. In addition to certain instruction concerning astral phenomena, which is handed down from father to son among them, they are set to work practicing visualization of things previously perceived. They are set to work upon, say, a rose. They must impress upon their memory the perfect picture of the rose no easy matter, I may tell you. Then they proceed to more difficult objects, slowly and gradually, along well-known principles of memory development. Along with this, they practice the art of reproducing that which they remember projecting it in thought-form state. And so the young magician proceeds, from simple to complex things from easy to difficult, until, finally, he is pronounced fit to give public exhibitions. All this takes years and years. Sometimes the boy grows to be a middle-aged man before he is allowed to publicly exhibit his power. Imagine a Western boy or man being willing to study from early childhood to middle age before he may hope to be able to show what he has been learning. Verily, the East is East, and the West is West, the two poles of human activity and expression. Another phase of psychic astral phenomena which should be mentioned, although it is manifested but comparatively seldom, is that which has been called telekinesis. By the term, telekinesis is meant that class of phenomena which manifests in the movement of physical objects without physical contact with the person responsible for the movement. I understand that the term itself was coined by Professor Kaus, with whose works I am not personally familiar. It is derived from the two Greek words tele, meaning far off, and kinesis, meaning to move. This class of phenomena is known better in the Western world by reason of its manifestation in spiritualistic circles in the movement of tables, etc., the knocking or tapping on tables and doors, etc., all of which are usually attributed to the work of spirits, but which occultists know are generally produced, consciously or unconsciously, by means of the power in the medium or others present, sometimes both. I would say here that I am not trying to discredit genuine spiritualistic phenomena, I am not considering the same in these lessons. All that I wish to say is that many of the phenomena commonly attributed to spirits are really but results of the psychic forces inherent in the living human being. Under certain conditions there may appear in the case of a person strongly psychic, and also strongly charged with prana, the ability to extend a portion of the astral body to a considerable distance and to there produce an effect upon some physical object. Those with strong clairvoyant vision may actually perceive this astral extension under favorable circumstances. They perceive the astral arm of the person stretching out, diminishing in size as it extends, 
just as a piece of flexible rubber shrinks in diameter as it expands in length, and finally coming in contact with the physical object it wishes to move or strike. Then is seen a strong flow of prana along its length, which, by a peculiar form of concentration, is able to produce the physical effect. I cannot enter into the subject of astral physics at this place, for the subject is far too technical to be treated in lessons designed for general study. I may at least partially explain the phenomenon, however, by saying that the projected astral arm acts in a manner almost precisely like that of an extended physical arm, were such a thing possible in nature. This astral body extension produces spirit wraps on tables, table tilting and movement, levitation, or the lifting of solid objects in the air, playing upon musical instruments such as the guitar, accordion, etc. In some cases, it is able to actually lift the person himself from the floor and carry him through the air in the same way. It may also cause the movement of a pencil in a closed slate or a bit of chalk upon a blackboard. In fact, it may produce almost any form of movement possible to the physical hand. In the case of the levitation of the person himself, the astral arms, and sometimes the legs as well, extend to the floor and push up the physical body into the air and then propel it along. There are many complex technical details to these manifestations, however, and in a general statement these must be omitted. Some who are firmly wedded to the spiritistic theory resent the statement of occultists that this form of phenomena may be explained without the necessity of the spirits. But the best ground for the statement of the occultists is that many advanced occultists are able to produce such phenomena, consciously, by an act of pure will, accompanied by the power of mental picturing. They first picture the astral extension, and then will the projection of the astral and the passage of the prana, or vital force, around the pattern of the mental image. In the case of some very highly developed occultists, the astral thought form of their body becomes so charged with prana that it is able to move physical objects. There are not mere theories, for they may be verified by any occultist of sufficiently high development. I do not wish to intimate that the mediums are aware of the true nature of this phenomena and consciously deceive their followers. On the contrary, most of them firmly believe that it is the spirits who do the work, unaware that they are unconsciously projecting their astral bodies, charged with prana, and performing the feat themselves. The best mediums, however, will generally tell you that they strongly wish that the thing be done, and a little cross-examination will reveal the fact that they generally make a clear mental picture of the actual happening just before it occurs. As I have already stated, however, the best proof is the fact that advanced occultists are able to duplicate the phenomena deliberately, consciously, and at will. I do not think that detracts from the wonder and interest in the so-called spiritistic phenomena. On the contrary, I think that it adds to it. Again invading the realm of the spirits, I would say that occultists know that many cases of so-called materialization of spirit forms take place by reason of the unconscious projection of the astral body of the medium. Moreover, such a projection of the astral body may take on the appearance of some departed soul by reason of the mental picture of that person in the mind of the medium. But, it may be asked if the medium has never seen the dead person, how can he or she make a mental picture of him or her? The answer is that the minds of the persons present, who knew the dead person, tend to influence the appearance of the nebulous spirit form. In fact, in most cases the medium is unable to produce the phenomenon without the psychic assistance of those in the circle. In this case, also, I would say that the advanced occultist is able to duplicate the phenomena at will, as all who have enjoyed the privilege of close acquaintance with such persons are aware. The fact the medium is usually in a trance condition aid materially in the ease with which the phenomena are produced. With the conscious mind stilled and the subconscious mind active, the astral phenomena are produced with much less trouble than would be the case if the medium were in the ordinary condition. Now, I wish to impress upon the minds of those of my readers who have a strong sympathy for the spiritistic teachings that I recognize the validity and genuineness of much of the phenomena of spiritism I know these things to be true, for that matter. It is not a matter of mere belief on my part. But I also know that much of the so-called spiritistic phenomena is possible without the aid of spirits, but by the employment of the psychic astral forces and powers as stated in these lessons. I see no reason for any honest investigator of spiritism to be offended at such statements, 
for it does not take away from the wonder of the phenomena and does not discredit the motives and power of the mediums. We must search for truth wherever it is to be found, and we must not seek to dodge the results of our investigations. There is too much wonderful phenomena in spiritism to begrudge the explanation that the occultist offers for certain of its phases. While I am on the subject of materialization, however, I would direct the attention of the student to my little book entitled The Astral World, in which I have explained briefly the phenomena of those planes of the astral in which dwell the cast-off shells of souls which have moved on to the higher planes of the great astral world. I have there shown that many astral shells or shades, or other astral semi-entities may be materialized, and thus mistaken for the spirits of departed friends. I have also explained in the same little book how there are certain powerful thought forms which may be mistaken for spirit materializations. I have also shown how many a honest medium is really a good clairvoyant, and by reading the records of the astral light is able to give information which seems to come from the departed soul. All of these things should be familiar to the earnest investigator of spiritism, in order that he may be able to classify the phenomena which he witnesses, and to avoid error and disappointment. In this connection, before passing on to the consideration of other phases of psychic phenomena, I would say that one of the best mediums known to the modern Western world a medium who has been consulted by eminent men, university professors, psychologists, and others, and whose revelations regarding past, present, and future astounded careful and intelligent men of international reputation this medium, at the height of her professional success, made a public announcement that she felt compelled, from conscientious motives, to assert that she had come to the conclusion that her message came not from departed spirits, but rather from some unknown realm of being, brought hither by the exercise of some faculty inherent in her and developed to a high power in her for some reason, which power seemed to manifest more effectively when she shut off her ordinary physical faculties and functioned on a plane higher than them. I think that the student of the present lessons will be able to point out the nature of the phenomena manifested by this medium, and also the source of her power. If not, I shall feel disappointed at my work of instruction. End of lesson.